Good morning, heart and soul. Now, y'all know that we continue to be on an adventure in faith. And so, you know, an adventure, just by definition, means that you don't know what's happening next. That, or that can be a part of it. This is the kind of adventure that I am having and that heart and soul is happening. Let me just let you know, and somebody signal me if this has shifted, that those of you who are joining us virtually, and thank you for that. Thank you for rolling over and touching something, clicking on something. Thank you for sitting up in bed. Thank you for moving to the table or whatever, it, whatever was required in order for you to tune in. I am grateful, and certainly to those of you who have come in, I am grateful for you being with us. What I know, though, is that the folks who are on Zoom, typically in that webinar, we can generate quite a little convo going using chat. But I'm told that for some reason we don't have the chat active uh, this morning. And so you can go to Facebook if you choose. Depending upon your device, you can work it out with us on YouTube because the beauty of it is that we have a team of hosts and facilitators who will interact with you. Just not on Zoom this morning. It is a, an adventure in faith for real. Yes? So we're going to get that fixed so that next week we'll have less of an adventure on Zoom anyhow. So... What I want you to know is that this summer school feels, um, well, you know, every summer school is juicy. But this one, I kind of feel like somebody bring me a, you know, I feel like I kind of need to just dab the corner of my mouth because it's like extra juicy. <laughs> I feel for a number of reasons. One, because we need it so. Lord, no, well, let me speak for me. Let me just speak for me and not trying to speak for the masses. I need it so desperately that in our planning for summer school 2022, we actually had chosen a book. And then as it evolved and we began to see what our best response could be to what we perceived to be our greatest need, we had to switch up the book. And I think we did that a couple of times, actually. And I'm so, so grateful that we landed on the work that we did land on because my dear brother friend, Dr. Sean Jenright, wrote a book recently, The Four Pivots, Reimagining Justice, Reimagining Ourselves. And so there was a moment in our planning when we realized, or, or I had the book, and I realized that what we were talking about was in the book. And so we decided that that would be our text. And so our beloved Sean has a message for us. Hey, heart and soul community, just wanted to say hello uh, and how honored I am to have you be reading The, the Four Pivots, Reimagining Justice and Reimagining Ourselves. Um, I, you know, I wrote that, I wrote the book, you know, because I deeply believe that many of us who love and care and have dedicated our lives to engaging in justice to create a better society need new tools. Um, the divisiveness that we have in our society, the polarization, the persistent and consistent dehumanization that we see in our systems and institutions, I think requires uh, new types of tools. And I don't want to call them new tools, but tools that our ancestors knew deeply and spiritually. And I'm just sort of reintroducing what we've already known, how to treat each other, how to slow down how to manifest and see the society that we want rather than toiling to fix the society that is already broken. I hope the book really inspires and pushes and nudges your imagination. I hope it irritates you when you engage in mirror work because we know that mirror work is the harder work that requires us to ask ourselves those tough questions about what wounded us about what do we need to heal from, 
about who we need to be to create the world that we actually imagine. And so uh, I, I hope the book um, challenges you. I hope it uh, you have deep and engaging conversations. And I hope you have humorous conversations, too. I really wanted the book to not be sort of theoretical and only, um, you know, some of the, my past academic books are only sort of built on theory, but that they that they make sense for our, our daily lives, but also um, the, our personal lives and our professional lives. The, you know, I call them the pivots because, you know, when we make these subtle changes um, over time, it has a profound and tremendous impact, not only in the quality of our lives, but the the capacity for us to be better professionally and ultimately have the deeper impact that we want to see in our in our society. Um, you know, my hope is that, um, you know, Heart and Soul uh, Summer School um, will join in this movement around the country uh, where people are using these four pivots to to usher in a new way of creating, envisioning, and doing justice. Um, my hope is that that every one of you will have a commitment to the four pivots, uh, that you will share these four pivots and really begin to use them in ways that I that that ultimately have that significant impact. Um, I've spoken to people around the country and, you know, I've been saying that we have a choice right now as a society. We can choose to engage and reproduce trauma in our schools, in our public policy, in our, our lack of, of investments in cities and parks and recreations and our communities. We can choose to reproduce trauma or we could choose to produce transformation. It's our choice. Right now is our choice. And the four pivots gives us permission to do the latter. These four pivots give us permission to reimagine the societies that we want, to have conversations about who we are and, and how we need to show up, to really think about and engage in deeper relationships and creating, cultivating those relationships. But it all requires a commitment to these pivots. And so I'm so honored and just thrilled that you'll be using um, this book and reading this book as a guide to your own inquiry. At the end of your summer school journey, I will be joining you and hopefully having a, a, a hearing about what you've learned and engaging you in conversations about you utilizing and you using the four pivots in your own work. So I thank you. I'm honored and I hope to see you soon. Take care. Bye bye. Yeah, I love me some Sean Jen Wright. I'm telling you. And this particular work, uh, you know, this is unusual for Heart and Soul. One, because I love a good reveal. So this is the first time before summer school has begun that we are looking at what the book is and encouraging folks to get it. So I'm over it now. But look, here's, here's, here's the thing for us. Here's the thing, that if you are interested in getting the book, we have acquired some copies. So if you're in the room right now, you can get one today, one or more. Um, otherwise, you can go to heartsoulcenter.org slash SS2022book, meaning the Summer School 2022 book, and receive um, our read for this summer. All you need to do is to make a minimum, an immediate minimum donation of $20. And that will cover your shipping costs. All you have to do is do that and we got you, right? I'm looking for somebody to nod at me who absolutely knows that we are ready for that. And if you're in the room, as I said, you can get it. Or if you're here next week as well, um, we can do that. Yes. 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 I think this is exciting. And so just to be crystal clear, this is our summer of shift. Now, some of you are thinking this is the decade of shift. And this has certainly been the last two and a half years of major shift. What we are going to do is to bring the focus to what's possible for us this summer, given that there's not a one of us who is not dealing with shift. And if we pass the mic right now, we would see just how varied 
our shift is, and yet we are all in shift. So join us for the Summer of Shift. It begins this Wednesday, and it's all virtual. So from wherever you are, just dare I say, be there or be square. So it starts at 6.30 Pacific time, and our intention is to always complete by 8 p.m. If there's something where we need a little bit more, we'll ask you. You know, we'll get your permission to just hang out just a little bit longer. My sense is we've never gone beyond like 8.15. And all of, well, let me not just, let me, <laughs> let me not make nothing up. <laughs> I could, I could, I was kind of intuitive in it, but I think I kind of heard a little energy like she about to say something that's not nearly true. So let me just stay with this year. So for this year, my sense is that it's till eight, and if there's something more that we just, sometimes we got to tend to it, then we'll let you know and we will give you an estimate of the 10 minutes or so, let me get off of this. So look, 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 look. Part of the reason that we are, well, it's not the reason as much as it is the divine intention that we are forever listening, in tuned with, following, being attentive to. It is in that calling, in our responsiveness to that, that you know, dare I say I, we, in wanting something more, something deeper, something, a more authentic connection with, to, in. You know, my language is fuzzy when you talk about the divine because oneness. So how do I say with the divine if I know I'm one? Because if I'm with, you know, with is a connecting word. And so it means that I'm connecting my I amness with something else. Well, that ain't what I'm doing. What I'm, I'm just trying to, I don't have the language. What I know is that we come seeking a more authentic, a true experience and an irrefutable demonstration that I and the Father be one. I know scripture says I and the Father are one, but if you use our, that means there's more than one. And so just for my own edification, just because maybe I'm a little slower than y'all, y'all can probably use our and work it out. But for me, I'm thinking I and the Father be one. So this idea of, of shifting begins, at least in my mind, about and I'm going to ask you to engage this today, to as I am sharing with you, or as Valerie Joy is singing, or as, uh, in, in fact, anything you've heard before, anything Sean said, to apply, see if there isn't an opportunity, see if within you, if there isn't an opportunity for shift, for shift in awareness, for shift in belief, for shift in knowing, for shift in action, behavior, response, to, be get, to take it in, to not have this be an event where you simply observed, where you kind of set through it and dare I say, you know, I'm always cautious about this when folks just have notes for other people. And it's not that other people couldn't use the note, but usually the note taker is the one who needs the note. I'm not, there could be exceptions. I'm just saying check that though. Before you pass them off, just rock with them for about a week and see if it didn't, if you mistakenly believed it was for her and for him and that maybe it was for you. I want to remind you that I have been for the past few weeks offering you revelations 21 and 1 and I saw a new heaven and a new earth and the former heavens and the former earth had departed and the sea was no more and I want to remind you that the sea represents the confusion 
in mind. Often when we are reading scripture and we are using our metaphysical, if you will, just beyond the physical intuition, knowing that there's something more in this message, we begin to see patterns. And we see that water is about the emotions. And specifically, when we talk about the sea, it's think about the sea. There's a lot of commotion in that. And so this is the heightened emotion, the confusion, the chaos. And so we're saying that that is no more because in my vision, in what I'm visualizing, and this is an opportunity for us to recognize, to sense, to visualize, to believe something more is possible beyond whatever our current demonstration and experience is. So just this notion of a new heaven a new ideal, a new possibility, a new outcome that maybe we are even reluctant to consider could be a possibility. I'm inviting you to take off the training wheels, to take off the whatever we're cloaked with that would have us limit our vision and our visualization of what's possible. These times, this decade of shift, this past five years of shift, I'm just saying, this, uh, this past two and a half years of shift, this week, this morning, Lord, can I just take a moment and say this morning, this morning of shift, that we have an opportunity to envision a new earth. So a new heaven means the ideal, the inf what you would choose out of the infinite field of possibility, your highest choice. And the earth is the manifestation, the demonstration, the concrete, the material of that, ex the material expression of that. Does that make sense? All right. So look, when we practice, and that's what I'm encouraging us to do, to practice seeing beyond current circumstances. Because we could have dual, dueling, dueling current circumstances. Mine is worse than yours. No, you win. And then we could, you know what I mean? That's a game that if we didn't know better, we could play. And it's a game that in the world is played. My trauma is worse than your trauma. I'm going to ask us to cut that out. Because if we begin practicing, seeing, intuiting, visualizing, envisioning beyond our current circumstances, we can more fully benefit from the truth that Corbin Henry says this way, we live in a universe that responds to what we believe. We live in a universe that responds to what we believe. Now, if you're willing to consider that, I'm not asking you to believe it, but let's just, since you're here, since you tuned in, let's ju just for drill, I'm not asking you to weigh in, just for drill, let's just try it on for size. If you believed that we live in a universe that responds to what we believe, I'm just saying, my sense is we'd get busy believing something else because we see what that got us. And it's not like some of us get to step out of the crowd and say, that wasn't me, because it's collective mind. It's race consciousness, which means we all have a thought in it. I'm just going to pause for a moment. So pause for forgiveness. We can just forgive our role in it, yes? And then Eckhart Tolle says, you attract and manifest whatever corresponds to your inner state. Now, you don't have to believe it, but just for drill, pretend like you do. And that gives you your work for this afternoon, doesn't it? Because if what you attract and manifest, what is demonstrated in your life, that means if your life experience. 
when we're talking about it's not fancy, what you attract and manifest, that's your life. And this is giving us a sense of how life gets to be, got to be, the way it is. It's that, one, we live in a universe that's ordered in a way such that it simply responds to what it is we believe. And we can look at the world and go, oh, my God, I got new believing to do, a new heaven and a new earth. Yes. And then we're reminded that what we attract and manifest, that our world mirrors our inner state. Sometimes, when I'm in the midst of a talk like this, there's a part of me that just wants to pause and go home for a moment and journal. Because the message or the word, the idea in a particular moment, and that was one of those moments that I just want to almost excuse myself and go, I got, I got a little work to do, y'all, a little inner, a little spiritual work just around that. Because knowing that it corresponds to my inner state, where's the work to be done? Where's the shift to happen? But I need y'all to signal me that you understand what I'm talking about. Do it online too. It's the inside, yes. It's the inner work is where our work must be done. And this is why a summer of shift is essential. Whether you do it with us or you do it on your own, I'm just going to say, please, let's do it. Let's do it. I want to give you an example of, of this because this is, this is one of, my, one of my favorite kind of scripture stories. So it's found in Matthew 8, um, verses, it be, the story begins kind of verses 5 through 10. And so hold off for a moment with that slide because I'm going to work my way there. Thank you so much. So look, this is when the master teacher, Yeshua, that uh, the world ultimately came to call Jesus, when he entered Capernaum, Scripture says a certain centurion. Now, I need to pull over for just a moment and say that anytime it says a certain, to me, I interpret that as saying that there are specific circumstances that are, this couldn't be just any centurion or the story would be different. This had to be the centurion who had the specific mindset set of circumstances, awareness, belief system, yes? So a certain centurion of a certain makeup, it'd be like a certain minister said, because they're not all saying that, right or wrong, I'm, that's not the point, but there's some difference, so a certain centurion, <clears throat> pardon me, Pardon me, please. It is said, and let me just say that anytime there are quotation marks, I use them lightly because there's just absolutely no way across, come on. But, but that doesn't mean that there isn't value there for us, but I just kind of stumbled when I was going to quote the man because I can't quote the man. But here's an idea that I can offer. All right? So here's the idea. He says to the master teacher, Yeshua, my Lord, my boy is lying in the house and is paralyzed and he's badly tormented. Now, depending upon your favorite version of scripture, your favorite translation, those words will vary, but the idea will be the boy's in trouble. He's not well. He's so ill that I have come to you specifically. Yes? All right. And then the master teacher, here in this version, is said to respond, I will come and heal him. Now, all of this is important because we get to this point where this certain centurion says, "Uh uh-uh, you don't need to. I'm not, don't even bother coming to my house. Because look, I, I know, I know who you are. I know you don't need to go to my house in order for this to work. See, I, I see who you are. I know how this works. You see, I am a centurion. I boss people around all the time. I report to people. I do what they say do. The people that report to me, I say come, they come. I say go, they go. Your word is way more powerful than mine. 
So what you say, you don't have to come go nowhere. When you say the word, the word is going to be done. You don't have to move another further. Now, I quote that verbatim. <laughs> Not another further. But look, the master teacher then responds to say, oh, oh, oh you are you a certain centurion. Well, I mean, you know, my version of it. You a certain kind of centurion. Because you know something that people don't tend to know. They think I have to go. They think it requires some pomp and circumstance. They're going to have to light a candle first. We're going to have to all hold hands and circle up first. We're going to have to do some. Is everybody wearing white? None of that. He's like, you, I, you the one who knows that none of that is required. You understand how it works. And because you understand how it works and you believe at the level that you believe in how it works, he's already healed. It's already done. And it is done, he says, as you have believed. He says, go. I'm reading the little quotation part here. Go. It, be, it is done unto you just as you have believed. And it says, and the boy was healed in that very hour. Now you see, it doesn't matter to anyone whether you believe that. I just want to be really clear about that, that whether it is or ain't, is not conditional on whether you believe it. It is in your life though. You know, there's not, not any group think around this in a sense, that changes your life experience. What changes your life experience is what you believe. So the master teacher Yeshua that the world ultimately came to call Jesus, him exclaiming about that centurion's conscious awareness and his honoring of the divine presence being non-local. That you don't have to bring it nowhere in order for it to work. That it's working with the never. And that he also, that he was acknowledging that the centurion seemed to understand the power in the law and the way it would respond to the master teacher's word. And that all of this revealed what? The centur that centurion's receptivity to truth. And that's really what I want to get to, is our receptivity to truth, which I'm going to declare can include the degree to which we are willing to shift. Our receptivity to truth means when we, or an example of it could be that when we have new information, we behave differently. When we believe the world is flat, we kind of act like it's flat. It's stuff you don't do, places you don't go. When you get new information that that's not the case, it opens up a new world for you, for some people. Can you see in there that that's not everybody's experience? But the key is here, this idea of, this notion of receptivity to truth. The degree to which you are receptive to the truth when you hear it. And nobody can make you. But that's an inside job again. That's something that you want to put you in charge of. Why? Because it is done unto you as you believe. While you are yet believing. So in the glossary, in the science of mind glossary, Receptivity, Ernest Holmes defines it as the power or capacity of receiving impressions. So some of us are like closed off. I ain't hearing that. You know, we like a kid, you know, like mm, I can't, if I cover my ears, that means you didn't say it. It's not a thing that I'm taking in at all. The quality of being able to absorb, to hold or contain your capacity 
my prayer is that that's part of our intention for the summer for our summer of shift that our capacity to love our capacity to see each other to hear each other to connect to know something more our willingness is all engaged because why the universe is responding to us all the time i know we act like just when we are in an aware moment when we need a parking place when we need to not be late and you know have the negative consequence of late but it's responding to us all the time with all of our thinking particularly the the groove that we cut in our thinking it's not responding to a thought we had about winning the lotto without buying a ticket. You know what I mean? They're, they're thoughts we have, if I had a million, you know. Mm. But it's the groove we cut in our consciousness, the train of our thinking, the consistency of it is what it's responding to, if you will. And it's constantly engaging us on every level. Here's the key. Spirit can only give us what we can take. So you see, the centurion, well, on my block, when I was growing up, the boys, the fellas had a saying, he got to bring some to get some. And I'm not going to try to interpret that for you right now what, in terms of how they meant it on the block. But for my purposes, metaphysically speaking, <laughs> it's this idea that the centurion had to bring a level of understanding and belief. Can you go with me with that? That the, the master teacher was simply the master teacher. He had whatever power, whatever intuition, whatever insights, whatever he was working with, he had always been working with that. He didn't get nothing new for the centurion. But the centurion had to bring something, had to bring like a level of understanding, a level of willingness, a, a, a capacity. Yes, yes, because look, Ernest Holmes says spirit can only give us what we can take. We are the vessel. So if we're a little thimble of consciousness, then no matter how much it's pouring out, no matter how much is available, well, I don't know, because some of us have been in situations where, where we've proven that, where we decided that what we were going to ask for was X, and we felt like, whoo, you know, it was kind of X plus two, and we're like, whoa, that's a lot, and then we get up in there with our X plus two that they agreed to, and you realize they play in X squared, <laughs> but that wasn't your consciousness. So it can only give you, and we would realize even if you somehow accidentally get it, you can only keep what you by right of consciousness can accept. God bless the child that's got his own. The rich get richer. It's by this consciousness the consciousness of wealth and abundance, and the poor get poor, it's by right of consciousness. I know it sounds tough, but again, in our understanding, part of it is like that centurion, how the thing works. He's like, oh, I know how it works, master. All you got to do is say. I don't have to be there for you to say. It works because of your consciousness, he's saying. And that's non-local. Ernest Holmes says it's necessary for us to accept the fact that spirit has already provided everything. And that we can increase our receptivity, remember, by treating ourselves after this manner. And he says this, that there is within me that which knows, understands, accepts, believes, recognizes, embodies. I know and I know that I know. 
I believe and am conscious that I believe. This is the centurion unveiled. You know, we've just stripped down to what is he walking in. That's why it had to be that centurion and not the other one that would need him to come go. Yes, is this? We're saying I am confident of the power of my own word and have implicit reliance upon the truth. I expect the truth to operate. That's Ernest Holmes, but he is saying what the centurion said and what he expressed. Yes. Oh, y'all going to have to do better. Somebody going to have to say something to me because I'm up here like working this out. Um, I apologize. I just realized I have no idea what that clock means right now. (laughs) And I was trying to get it back, but my conscious mind is somewhere else, and it's not, like, letting that in. So I'm just going to make a decision to it. No, we're not doing that. We're not doing that. Um, mm, mm, mm. This isn't a retreat, is it? We're going to treat it like a Sunday service and not a retreat. Okie dokie. Um, okay, so look at here. Look at here. Here's what we're going to do. Okay. No, no, I'm, no I, I can't trust that right now. Because <laughs> why? I'm a certain minister. <laughs> And I know not to even go there right now, but I appreciate the vote of confidence. It's just slightly misplaced this morning. <laughs> just slightly misplaced. Y'all don't even know. Because I didn't work myself up into a, yeah, yeah. Um, mm, Look at here. This is from Ernest Holmes. Um, and here's the thing. I often, from my own notes, will do my own kind of version of it. So here's, this is what I will share with you. And this is, maybe it will help, but maybe allow your eyelids to close and just hear my voice. If you're willing, if you are, if your receptivity is, is open, if you're open to and receptive to this idea that I'm going to read it in first person so that you can allow it to just sink in according to your willingness. Because remember, you the vessel. Can't nothing get in that you don't, don't allow in. And so I know, since I know the truth of my being, I will no longer hinder nor retard my good from coming to me. I expect and accept all that I need to make life happy and worthwhile. For I'm a child of the Spirit, a child of God, a child of the living one, the strong one, and every attribute of it, of the living one, the strong one, every attribute of good is my inheritance. Nothing but lack of faith. Nothing but a lack of faith can keep my good from me. For I am one with the universal essence of life. Or we can call it spirit. And its substance will manifest in my experience as I believe. No longer Will I go for my good carrying only a dipper or a thimble or any container that is smaller than my heart and my consciousness? And so it is. Here's the thing, y'all, that this notion that the only thing that is between us and our highest and best is our lack of faith, 
is the stories that we tell ourselves about why we're not worthy, why not, how not. Some of us got whole, you know, we've developed the whole spreadsheet, the whole grid on the matrix is set up, <clears throat> pardon me, on how it's not going to work for me. And all around you, it's working. All around us, it's working. There are those who know, and Ricky Byers wrote a song about this, but there are those who know that right inside our pain and our weakness is the seed of something greater. Now, the one who doesn't know that is often doomed to be depressed, be desolate, and just go into a downward spiral. And that's a just is. Here's the thing. For the one who understands how life gets to be the way it is, for that one who can come to herself, himself, that one can realize that within this very experience, this darkness that I'm experiencing right now is the seed of something greater. And that if there is any shame of not choosing higher and all the disappointing moments, and there are plenty, the wise folks know and allow them to fade into God. That it's not that stuff hasn't happened. It's not that it hadn't been awful and even worse than awful. It's whether we have the capacity and are willing to be in the capacity, living in, acting in, being in, the capacity of allowing it all to fade into God. Why? because we know that no mistakes have been made in God. That all of the ways that we seem to fail, it all fades in to God. And here's a favorite part of the lyric for me. That the stars are shining to remind me that a seed requires the darkness to grow into, to change into new life. That new heaven, it's probably going to be dark before it's light. Because a shift has to happen. A seed requires the darkness to change into new life. God is the gravity. Somebody needs to know this right now. That God is the gravity that holds me together. Inside my pain is the seed of my strength. This is the time when we, I do the closing prayer. And I just want to acknowledge that, um, that our community is grieving. That we have are experiencing a tremendous loss in that our beloved brother, Everett Ursary, passed um, last week. And we're missing him. We're missing him on so many levels. You know, certainly just personally and on the feeling tone of it all at the heart level. And what's true is that Everett was such a contributor to heart and soul of his time and talent. And so there's, there's so much that he touched. There's no way to come in here on Sunday that you, if you didn't see Everett, that would be unusual, let me just say that. It would be unusual to not see him here. But even if you didn't see him, you would see what he had done because he has done so much and continued to do so much. And so I want to, I, want, I needed to bring this at the end. I really thought I would begin because it's deserving of that. But I wasn't clear 
that I could deliver the message. And so now that the message is delivered, I can pause for a moment and also acknowledge his family. His two daughters are here today, Julia and Morgan, and their husbands, Otto and Brian, and his two grandchildren. And so his immediate circle, we are encircling them because we love him so very, very much. And because love has no boundaries, that spills over. <laughs> you know, it's just like, so y'all are probably wet right now, just with all the love splashing all over you because we love him so very, very much. There's this whole idea of summer school from the time that Everett came to Heart and Soul. I knew he was going to be a part of summer school because it was in his spirit. And so every summer school he has served, and he was serving in the preparation for this summer school as well. And so I just say that to just acknowledge, because it would be strange to not acknowledge that there's a, we had a, there was a circle, and now there's somebody, you know, there's an energetic that is not present in that circle in the same way. You have to listen to my whole thought now to get it all. So the energy is still there. It's not there in the same way. And so I needed to say that because he often is my counterpoint where Jamar is right now, that he takes his has taken his turn and would be our sound tech for that and just leads, is the, is the lead for our facilities. And so it's going to require a new language. But for right now, I'm comfortable with saying is the lead because there's so much that he did early on. You know what I mean? So it's like, anyhow, y'all know I'm right now, I'm just altered consciousness. And, um, you know, working it out. Um, heart and soul, member, elder, and my dear friend. And I am so very grateful. So, so very grateful, and thank you, family, for sharing. We are all the better because he is here with us. So thank you. What I'm also going to do just to, um, I don't know, I'm just doing what I'm guided to do. I was going to try to give you some reason, but I don't know what that is, that um, I'm going to, I close in prayer now, and um, from time to time I'll read a prayer. Sometimes it'll be Ernest Holmes or whatever. Today it's Everett Erster's prayer. This is a prayer that he wrote for the purpose of, it worked okay when I was at home reading it. This is a prayer treatment that he says is for ongoing, ongoing, ongoing unfoldment of life purpose. And so I'm sharing that. Everett wrote, there is only one life. This is the perfect life of divine spirit. This perfect life is all life and exist from everlasting to everlasting. These are literally, I've not changed a thing. This perfect divine spirit exists in, through, and around its entire creation and contains, supports, creates, and evolves all life. This one perfect life is all there is. This perfect life is my life now. This one perfect life exists through and as me. My purpose in this life is to express the life of the divine. I exist to do what spirit would have me do. Be what spirit would have me be and say what spirit would have me say. I accept this unity as the reality of my life and indeed the reality of all life. I give thanks for the knowledge that my life is the life of spirit. 
My one life purpose, purpose is to express the life of spirit. I proclaim that spirit is all love, all grace, and all that is good. I accept that spirit is continually creating and manifesting through its creation. I am sustained by spirit. I am guided and protected by spirit. My life purpose is to express spirit in all that I do and all that I am. I give thanks for my life and for all life. I give thanks that I am a part of the whole, which is the ever-evolving creation of spirit. I give thanks for the love of my life, for the love that is creation. I am grateful for everything because I know that God is love. I release this prayer into the perfect activity of law which always affirms the good, and I seal it for all time. Amen. And so it is. Everett submitted this on May 26 of this year. I'm here to remind us that love matters. 